welcome to episode 22 of That 60s Recording Podcast, conversations inspired by the golden era of recording. I hope you've all had a fantastic couple of weeks, um, had lots of great feedback for the Shell Tell Me episodes. Um, he was such a pleasure to speak with um, and he, having done that episode, I've connected with quite a few other people. Um, you know, his Shell seems very keen to document um sort of his stories on facebook um and that kind of uh yeah that kind of stuff and he's spoken to a, a few people who i have now spoken to um so there should be future episodes um involving some of the people i've met as a result of having done that episode if that makes any sense at all <laughs> um okay so this week i'm speaking with a an engineer and producer um from london Oh, and studio owner, um, called Simon Trott. Something I've done from the beginning of this podcast, um, if you're a new, a new listener to this, is speak with people who perhaps weren't obviously involved in 60s recording, but have a, a mentality that is um, particular to rec 60s recording, if that makes any sense. So, you know, it, we're not talking about uh, adjusting stuff in your... Um, Logic or Pro Tools, your DAW, um, or you know, auto tuning. It's all an attitude about getting stuff right on the way in, and having a particular feel uh, in in what you're recording. And I think that it's still really interesting. It's certainly interesting for me to have conversations with the, with these people. Um, and I hope that you enjoy listening to them, and I hope that goes some way to explaining <laughs> why I have a why i have these people on you know i I love talking especially about the beatles with with a lot of uh with anyone basically <laughs> um and i think that although we've got a lot of technology available to us um, i think that it's more important now than ever to have a particular mindset and um you know as, as much as it's really interesting obviously and a, a real honor to speak with guys who were actually around in the 60s i find it E equally interesting um, to speak with people who are influenced a lot by 60s music you know and, and 70s obviously it's not quite as a uh, as easy to pigeonhole into the you know just purely the 60s because everything seems to evolve um, right through to sort of mid mid to slightly late 70s as well so anyway i'll quit rabbiting and get on so simon trott um absolutely lovely guy owner of soup studios and we discuss uh boats and his tape machines and recording pitfalls of recording on a boat <laughs> so here we go enjoy simon trott Okay, so I'm really pleased to uh, be joined on the phone by Simon Trott, who is the founder of Soup Studios in London, um, which, if uh, you haven't heard of it, is a, a ridiculously cool studio that um, we'll talk about more of this in a second, but it, it is on a boat. <laughs> so um, that just to wet your whistle about what's coming. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming to chat to me, Simon. I appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, so... I mean, obviously, the first thing I want to address is the fact that you have a studio on a boat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite... It's, I guess it's a ship. Uh, it's a, rather than a boat. A boat. Uh, <laughs> pro probably think of a little barge or something, but it's uh, it's an enormous uh, big red ship just uh, moored up just on the bottom of the River Lee, just as it joins the, the Thames down in East London. Uh, it is, um, is it, does it move at all, or is it just static? No, the last time it moved was when there's no engine in it anymore. Uh, uh, but the last time it moved was a few years ago when the boat owner uh, got married and he got a tugboat to, to tow the boat uh, up the Thames to a, a sweet spot and they kind of got married there and, uh, uh, yeah, and then towed it back. So, you know, it comes up and down with the tide. You know, during the tide cycle, you're up depending on where the moon is, obviously. But, you know, you're sometimes up, up bobbing around on the tide for a good three, four hours of a tide cycle. Are you quite aware of when you're recording that you're on a moving sort of thing? Yeah, it's all, it's all weather dependent, totally. Oh, wow. And Yeah, I mean, if the river's busy and the wind's up and there's, you know, you can be, <laughs> you can be really, really swaying around. You know, you can be kind of... 
you know, at, at its wor- at worst or best, uh, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> uh, you know, you're looking out of the porthole. There's, a, there's uh, a series of portholes just in front of the console in the control room, and you're staring against uh, the kind of dock wall, as it were. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you can be seeing those bricks move up and down, you know, I don't know, two or three feet, you know, like wow. quite... You know, and kind of sudden jerks against the ropes if there's like, like I say, busy uh, river traffic That's going crazy. past in the in the summer. Yeah, so it's, it gets quite nuts. But I mean, to be honest, it's been really quiet. You know, this last year the river's been quiet. Mm. So, um, uh, so we've yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah, we've not had the really scary uh, uh, ups and downs. You do get used to it. And I, I, you still have to remind yourself because a lot of people come to record there for the first time, and you have to remember back to those first few weeks when we first moved on there, and how exciting and shocking at the same time it was <laughs> that we're floating around in this, you know, five hundred ton metal ship, you know, with all your gear on there and all the mics on stands and everything. And uh, oh, that's a point, is uh, it? Is it sort of um because I've been trying to rack my brains about um I know when we we spoke in uh last week in sort of the the run up to this conversation you mentioned yeah. that there's pros and cons about the boat and I was trying to rack my brains about what kind of pros and cons there would be and everything you've mentioned so far is not something I thought of um but yeah. is there like an inertia in the boat does is it is that the right word do, do is it like a vacuum in the sense that nothing falls over when the boat moves or do you get mics and stuff falling over? Um, <clears throat> never, never had it. Uh, never had anything fall over, but it's more, <laughs> we, we have a lot of uh, weights hanging around. It's more that, you know, your, your mic stand, if we've got a few that are on wheels, you know, so, you know, if, you, if you're not careful and you don't wedge them properly, you know, they'll be sliding you know slowly crawling across the room yeah <laughs> um so like when when it's when the boat's parked uh when the tide's out you're on the bottom um and it doesn't always land level it lands in a different place every time and if and sometimes you land and you've got a, you're on a list uh just a slight one but it's always uh the way the studio's positioned so when you sat at the control desk on your kind of you know stu- uh, producer's chair on wheels <laughs> you have to kind of hook your knees underneath the mixing console <laughs> so that you so that otherwise you just kind of start moving backwards you know towards the sofa so wow. i absolutely so, love it it's so interesting <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it's all just for that it's just it's fun stuff it's and the history of the boat is amazing it's really you know we're i'm proud to be you know part of the story a little part of it of the story of the boat you know so how long have you been, been um sort of resident in it I, i'm pretty sure it's it'll be three years okay oh, so it's still yeah, fairly recent three years is, yeah 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 and you mentioned the history of the boat what well, what is the history of the boat uh it, it was a light, light ship there was quite a few of them stationed around the uk um for quite i'm guessing it was kind of turned of the century you know um there's lots of areas where you can't get a lighthouse you know there's lots of shifting sands and diff- you know different uh kind of hairy places mm. for for ships and yeah there was about 200 of these big red light ships but a floating lighthouse basically a manned floating lighthouse that was stationed around uh the UK this, this one um that we're on lightship 95 that was uh down on the goodwin sands uh, one of maybe four that would patrol around there, okay. um, and, you know, keep stray ships from, uh, you know, coming a cropper on the uh, on the shifting sands down oh, there. Cool. So, Do you know how old yeah. it is? Um, I, I, I did, and I've forgotten. I can't remember. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but like, like I say, it's some. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's kind of maybe uh, turn of the century pre First World War, maybe something like that. Oh wow! So Not quite sure. significantly there's, old. There's, yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, photos that the the boat owners found of of that boat and also the similar ones and there's you know they look like proper old victorian salty sea dogs these dudes that were <laughs> manning these uh manning these ships yeah oh wow very cool uh, yeah and then just the whole story of um you know of ben who kind of it was a bit of a rusty hulk you know decommissioned he he found it had the brainwave to make it into a studio and 
just yeah there's a whole story on youtube of how he you know he um he renovated it oh and, really uh, yeah yeah there's all sorts of interesting stuff on it that um from when he uh took took the project on yeah oh, and he, he he ran he ran it as a studio for a few years until he went on to do other stuff so so it's just nice to be part of its story really just a little bit yeah it's very yeah, cool and it makes it yeah um you know something i have found is that a lot of studios seem to be sort of located in places that you wouldn't expect to find a studio um yeah you know before you're a studio owner um you kind of imagine that your studio is going to be in some perfect location with perfect walls and perfect this and it's going to be completely yeah, per- soundproofed and perfect all. perfect access and storage yeah, yeah. But- <laughs> and then the reality yeah. is when it comes down to paying rent you end up in i mean like my my story is nowhere near as good as yours but you know i'm in the living room of a, an old flat above a, a brass band social club <laughs> and i love it though yeah yeah it's yeah. exactly that kind of thing and you um you know, once you sort of uh, let go of your <laughs> your sort of a naive idealism, you you realise that it's actually quite a cool, inspiring place to be. And I can imagine that's exactly how it is on the boat. It must be an inspiring place to be working. Yeah, it it is. It is. I mean, like I say, once you get down to the nitty gritty, you kind of could be anywhere as well. You know what? You know, once you're kind of over the the fun of getting on the boat and getting yeah. set up and everything, you know. <laughs> You know, not everyone's there just to uh, wallow in the heritage of the boat. Yeah, they've come to make music and it's they've come to soup soup studio to you know get some groovy shit down. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, of course, you know, and kind of, that's brought you forget me... about, it. and then and then the tide comes up, and then suddenly you're reminded, you know, <laughs> that you're on the boat. So, <laughs> well, that's but yeah. I mean, it's just it's 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 you know it's difficult. You know, if the if it's wet, you know, getting on the boat, getting off can be difficult. It's just you know it's a kind of drawbridges and a kind of steep laddery stair thing access down to the control room and live room and you know there's there's lots of cons to it but the pros far far outweigh them to be honest <laughs> and like I, like i said i've never had this dream studio in all the spaces that soup's been in they're always compromised you know unless you're uh you know unless you've got there uh, some big amazing self-built studio somewhere in the countryside it's just always going to be compromised you know so but you it's, just get used to it and uh, yeah it's what makes it fun isn't it the the, yeah, way, the yeah, way totally. that you work around those compromises totally yeah um you kind of brought me nicely onto um the point i didn't i didn't want to speak to you because you your studio's in a boat <laughs> um you know so i'll put a bit of context that we we sort of loosely know each other i suppose from instagram um yeah and i you just get an instinctive feeling or I get an instinctive feeling that when you look at Instagram is obviously a shop window. It's not, um, you know, yeah. it's not social media is not ideal, but I know I knew straight away from looking at what you're doing, that you were somebody who would be of interest to me. Uh, I wasn't thinking sort of podcast wise or anything. I was just thinking music wise, what you're doing looks to be something that I, um, I affiliate with almost. And then, um, yeah. the more I dug into it, the more I realised that your approach to recording must be influenced by the sorts of things I'm interested in, which is sort of 60s analogue style recording. And then when the when we chatted the other week, it turns out you're a huge Beatles fan, which is always a win for me. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, so there, ju- just for um, the listeners who have listened to us talk about a boat for, <laughs> for 10 minutes, now have at yeah, least yeah. some perspective on why you're here. Um, you know, and, and I think it's going to be really interesting to dig into the way that you approach yeah. things. I mean, I've been listening through to some of the... Um, the recordings you've made that you you put on the website and there's something really special about all of them and I'm I'm excited to speak to you about about how you approach those. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. So before before we do do that, um, I'd love it if you could tell me a bit about your journey to. So you 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 mentioned Soup Studios as um, almost like a standalone thing. It wasn't born to be put on the boat it was a thing before that and so how how long have you sort of uh, run soup studios it's around uh, it's around 20 years now those uh 20 years have gone by pretty quick <laughs> um but yeah it started um uh main i was I, I was in a band uh and we'd recorded a few records here and there um 
and it got to, I'd, I'd always been into recording from a kid you know I'd inherited a you know Tascam four track when I was you know really young and was always prattling around making stuff and uh and we were you know I was in this kind of uh kind of cool DIY band uh that you know kind of started started going places we didn't mean to it was, it was <laughs> a kind of a, a, accidental bedroom project that kind of got out of hand you know um but when it came to do I think it was the third record or something like that. yeah we um I kind of got to the point where I was so interested in record. I'd I'd be the guy in the band who at the studios was just annoying the engineer or producer sat right next to him for the whole session, you know, trying to get my hands on everything and just <laughs> soaking up how how you do all this in a, in a bigger, you know, capacity to to just working with a little four track tape machine. So the hunger there was to for for me me and the band to record record this album ourselves. So. Uh, we ended up, um, you know, asking the record label instead of the money to go into a studio to record, if we could take the money and rent a, some space somewhere for a while and uh, buy a little bit of gear and give it a go ourselves. And they they were, you know, probably not that happy to oblige because it wasn't a, uh, a commercial success that record. <laughs> but it's uh, but it's what. Uh, you know, it's just it's what got me going really, and I couldn't. Uh, when the album was finished, you know, after three or four months or something, you know, that was the deal was well, I just we'll give this space up, you know, and just kind of get on with stuff. But I was so attached to it, and even by that time, I would I'd started to record other bands on the label, and just mm. sudden, suddenly, you know, it was a viable thing to do to just kind of keep it going and try and get bands in and bits of work and pay the rent, and you know, it was. Uh, just started from there really so by the time you had asked to to record that third album yourself you you'd already had a, a reasonable amount of experience was it practical experience or just the experience of recording two albums in the studio yeah i mean just you know i was obviously focusing you know hard on you know playing the guitar and we we're making this music and everything but whenever i wasn't playing i was uh totally nerding out probably with a you know, with a vision of something to be able to just somehow do this as as a job or something, or just be able to keep you know recording. So um, you must have had yeah. a, a level of of confidence in your ability um, to to sort of want to do it yourself. I mean, I I can remember just being scared um, <laughs> scared shit <laughs> about doing recording yeah. because you you don't know what you're doing and you're scared of making mistakes, but. Um, what, yeah, what, no, yeah, I, where to, was your head at? I totally agree. But luckily, the you know the type of music that I'm into and and was recording was quite lo-fi music. You know, I was obsessed with the uh, tape op magazine back then and just all the kind of funky, cheap ways you can record that aren't high. I was quite anti hi-fi, anti commercial recording. So, you know, the the more bizarre it sounded sometimes was better, and that was just because you were make, like you say making mistakes and just learning learning as you went along really that's I, I think that's really cool I think it's really brave um, to, yeah. to want to do it and do you remember what gear so you I, bought yeah uh, well the first thing was uh, was an M-Box I've still got it actually I'm looking at it now it's on my shelf down in my <laughs> room but um, which was which was a marvel for me I'd never worked on a computer before that it had always been tape machines uh, and this was the only uh, way we could do it with the yeah, the little bit of money we got to kind of self fund the record was um was buying an M box and, you know, nicked a laptop from, you know, the singer's college where he worked and stuff like that. And so just had a really basic Pro Tools setup. It hadn't been out that long, I don't think, at the time. Um and just it was quite good because they've only got they've only got two ins. Uh and it was a one room space. So, you know, you're in there with the band, with the doing doing everything in a in the same room, pop some headphones on. When you track it, so yeah, I got to learn how to record drums with with two mics. You know, I didn't even have then a mixer to submix some mics in and then just take the stereo channel into the the door, as they call <laughs> it. Um, so that was quite interesting. And then after a little while, I got hold of a um, a Fostex E16 uh, little. I think they're like quarter, quarter inch, half inch uh, reel to reels. Mm -hmm. So that <laughs> that produced quite a conundrum because. You know, I'd, I'd fill up the tape, you know, and record albums and stuff on there. And then I had a real, like, cack-handed way of getting them 
getting them onto the computer so that I could mix them and finish them off on the computer. So, you know, like luckily learning how to get a good sound out of two channels on the drums was essential because I could only take two channels down at a time. So, <laughs> you know, I'd, uh, you know, take the drums across. Like, And there was a band I was working with um, who were kind of, it's like Sonic youth pavement, kind of like really long, kind of heavy guitar solos and stuff, really cool stuff. Yeah. But after... You know, some of the songs were seven or eight minutes long, and you know, after three or four minutes of recording two tracks at a time onto the computer, you know, you've gone you've gone out of sync by like <laughs> half a second, you know, a second, you know. So, apart from the drums, which you'd you'd transfer back to digital first, everything else afterwards had to be you know incrementally chopped up <laughs> and nudged, you know, and then all put back to you know into one piece, you know, after a after you dumped it all back down so yeah just really crude crude method but it worked i got the joy of being able to record you know lots of stuff on a tape machine and keep that thing going but then the the joy of you know mixing and uh pratting around <laughs> on the computer afterwards so yeah that's very cool i uh i'm i'm really interested this is a selfish question but do you remember how um how you mic the drums up with two mics yeah, I do. I think um, it, I'd managed to get with that M box. I think we'd got a couple of oh, I can't remember the brand now when they came out, but some kind of you know Chinesey kind of brand where it was like a, a copy, not a valve, but a copy of a kind of eighty seven type of thing. You know, a big condenser mic. You know, you went through loads of them because you drop them and they just shatter to pieces. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just pop one down. You know, in about two two meters away from the kick. You know, on the you know, towards the floor tom, you know, that kind of end of the kick drum. Mm -hmm. And then a, another another one just coming straight in from the side uh, to pointing at the snare. Uh, this is before I'd even nerded out enough to know about, you know, kind of Glyn John's technique or anything of having that kind <laughs> of set. It was kind of, it was like a, it was a version of the Glyn John's technique, I suppose, where, you know, you just, okay, you'd lose a bit, you lose a bit of definition here and there on a, you know, on some toms and whatnot, on some cymbal focus, but it was good enough, you know, for what we were doing to have a, a picture of a drum kit that was convincing and felt and felt good, yeah. I think a lot, so much of um, a drum sound is the drummer themselves, and if they're getting well, a, that's a, a good balance. That, yeah. That's the thing. I mean, mo most, you know, surely 90% of the drum sound is the drummer, the kit, and how it's tuned and the space it's in. You know, that is probably... Uh, you know, if if I just stuck one fifty seven pointing at it, so you know, even back then there were some really good musicians knocking around who I was recording. Yeah. Uh, luckily, they didn't mind you know being recorded in such a kind of slack handed, <laughs> kind of lo fi way. <laughs> but when but when someone plays a kit really well, it just sounds good. Whatever you put up, you know, it's hard not to make it sound good if it's if it's tuned well and and is played well. So. I I find it um I just find it really interesting that you you were forced into um into recording that way and i i love that i mean it um it makes me laugh that i send out um sort of 13 14 tracks uh, worth of wow. stems it, when i send yeah. you know my stuff off and that's what you know if you, the isolated drum stuff i've done that if you um the the sort of stereo mix or mono mix that i do is just one overhead um and then the two room mics um, and, a, yeah. and an outside kick mic and that's it and then I put yeah. all of the other ones there just so that people can mess about with it but yeah I think that um if I if I could have it my way I just have one overhead and I just have that that one overhead one kick drum and two rooms and that's it or even just you know yeah. the two rooms sound great exactly like you've just described um yeah you know yeah. I love that that sound and I wish it takes a, a lot of confidence for people to commit to that sound um yeah it does it does you know, the, you need a lot of bravery to uh, to commit to stuff like that. And like I say, you, you're working in a professional capacity the same as I am, you know, with clients who they might, they might even just use the kind of three groovy mics and not bother with all the other stuff. But you have to give people the options, you know. Absolutely. You have to cover, cover your back and let them let them make the choices. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how... Um just sort of gear wise how did you graduate from where you were to um 
I mean, perhaps you could tell us sort of uh, where, you, how you got from there to where you are at the studio now, and what you, what gear you've got there that you're you're currently <laughs> using. Um, yeah, it was it was slow. I didn't. I never had any kind of money or investment to kind of you know just get a load of stuff. It was just. I mean, back then you still could pick up bits of gear, good gear, you know, r- fairly cheaply. Uh, so I would just. Um, you know, like, uh, what did I start? It's, you know, buying a, you know, an 87, you know, a kind of drama 1960 dual valve thing, a, you know, DBX over easy compressor. Kind of managed to buy one of those type of things, you know, every year or something or every six months. Mm-hmm. You know, now they cost a fortune, but back then, you know, it was like, you know, five, six hundred pounds for, for that stereo you know draw my unit and the dbx was like 400 quid probably like (laughs) two grand now something so like it was expensive but still affordable and i'd just you know kind of pile it on a credit card and then when i'd made some money (laughs) outside of the studio (laughs) i'd kind of pay the credit card off you know but uh uh so slowly built it up um and over the year like more recently um because you know um it's not just me running soup now you know but there's three other engineers that that work there who i've kind of collected along the way and you know that th- they all had little bits of gear from their project studios or this or that or previous studios so you know beg borrow and steal really um you know every time i moved studio i'd probably you know find that bit of extra money just to you know like get a slightly better tape machine upgraded that e16 that fostex to a tascam oh, i can't remember what it was called now but that was a really groovy one inch 16 track <laughs> it had uh dolby on or off on every channel as well you could select on every channel if you wanted the old dobly <laughs> so that was really cool and it had some really tape good tapey sound you could you could really push that into distortion a really really lovely distortion uh like the atari that we've got now um that's uh it's just a really good if you try and push too much into that it, it, even if you're using the thinner tape it just doesn't sound that good mm-hmm. it, you know it kind of goes into a kind of harsh kind of you know kind of sound rather than silking and velvety you know yeah so um yeah but yeah just like i think Sa- uh, another engineer sam who works there he he picked up the uh the atari mtr 90 found it on ebay and uh it was it did belong to manfred mann apparently a Ooh. member of manfred mann Just it's kind of weird at that time like you'd look on ebay and like loads of stuff seemed to belong to manfred mann it was always in the listing you know x man x manfred mann this or that uh, and it was true yeah um you know he spoke to uh the guy's wife who was selling it you know it was a kind of part of a kind of estate sale type of thing so uh it had a bit of history but uh yeah, that's I really like that. That's a really solid, solid tape machine. Like I said, not to do anything really super weird on it. You've, it's just really a really good, accurate, but with the bump of the tape, you know, um, just you know, because <laughs> we run a kind of a homemade clasp kind of setup mm-hmm. at the studio where we, you know, you can literally get everything on the board, um, all going to digital. You know, get your whole mix up, get everything sounding good, and you can literally hit, hit play and record on the tape machine, and buff. You know, then you're listening straight back off the the repro head, and you just wow, the whole thing just lifts. You just get this kind of boost of energy. You know, all the mics sound suddenly better. You know, because they're all just pushed in a little bit and saturated. So that's you know that's really really pleasing to use that machine it's lucky to still be alive actually it's been it's blown up twice that thing <laughs> just through unfortunate circumstances in the last studio before we moved on the boat we'd um, built this really nice place um uh you know it was a- absolute pride of joy we kind of moved on because the the lease was kind of not really happening it was going to be developed and whatnot so we moved on but we'd built this uh even to the point of having a really nice tape machine room with sliding doors so you could constantly monitor the tape vu levels and the tape but you know from the control desk but it was totally silent wasn't in the room you know vented but up above it was a shower block oh, um wow. which uh which just leaked one day and just just came down all over the uh tape machine and blew blew that up 
Uh, luckily, got that fixed somehow. Um, it, the damage wasn't as bad. You know, it was just lots of... God knows what they do. But he, he got it going again, and it was fine. And then, it, again, oh, only about two years ago, on the boat, you know, just a simple thing. We'd stupidly plugged in, like, a, a lamp, just a little lamp that we used to, you know, to see where you put in the bantams in the patch bay. <laughs> and, you know, someone's chair leg just, just kind of went on this... Uh, just shorted out this lamp and we'd plug the lamp into you know the same plug as the um as the tape machine and we hadn't isolated it with breakers and stuff and that absolutely fried the tape machine we're still now repairing it you know it fried the uh, remote control it just loads of channels just we can't can't get them back even after hours and ex lots of expensive engineers trying to come and fix it so we're we're running that at like 20 20 channels at the moment rather than the 24 but so it's still going strong, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, it's had quite a few knock, knock arounds, that one. Yeah, sounds it. Uh, the the picture that you you paint of, of uh, using that the tape machine through the desk, it makes a, uh, you know, make, made my hair stand on end. I want to come and, <laughs> come and see it and listen to it. It just yeah, sounds, I mean, sounds it, amazing. It's, it, it's amazing. Um, I mean, it, I, I guess it all, like, technically, you know, there's just that, kind of bottom end boost a little uh, and a little bit of softening on the highs but also pushing into that softening you know a saturation and it just you know smooths out all those peaks and it just really it really I don't, it's hard to explain it but it is you're right it's quite magical when you just hit record um and just listen to it all coming through the tape is it, it something is, it, you're it, using it, um reg regularly are you or are you do you use it as a matter yeah, of course yeah. or do you get requested to do people ask to use it no i try um if it's projects that are bands that i record a, a fair few times and you know you know and it, and they understand it takes a little longer to record to tape uh i use i use it as much as possible uh in recent times you know it's just been a bit stressful um just um you know, at the moment, this last year, people have just been running in and out when they can during lockdowns to get bits done. And yeah, yeah we're not in the we're not in the zone to be kind of chilling out and really nerding out the tape machine. So, not been in, in use as much recently. But before that, you know, I would kind of insist on it for a lot of sessions. I just preferred the sound. You know, it's less work afterwards. I'd, if you go onto the tape, there's less faffing about getting rid of weird frequencies and spikiness and trying to. You know, you start overusing plugins because you you're not you haven't got what you wanted from the tape. So, and it's yeah, it's just um, oh, what was I going to say? It's uh, it's it's like that. You you understand why they would have a tape op back in the day? Yes. You know, it's constantly running around all day. You've got fifteen minutes on high speed. You know, you've got to time the band's takes so you can rewind the tape and go over it again and capture that. You know, and there's always channels popping in and out. Even when it's fully functioning, it's just a big analog beast. <laughs> you know, and a needle, a needle stick. You have to go and tap it to make sure you're not, you know, you're still in the sweet spot and everything. So it's quite, you know, it's a physical job. If you're just um, running running a session on your own without an intern or a, or a, another engineer, it's it's just a lot to manage all in one go. When you're trying to keep a <laughs> an eye on the music, you're producing it, you're doing this, blah blah blah, you know, and man in this big beast of a tape machine. So, not been using it as much, but do it do enjoy it when the time's right. There's been albums before where I've just insisted on <laughs> every last little BV or tambourine. No, no, it's got it. We've got to do it through the tape. Got to do it through the tape. So, <laughs> kind of, I've kind of chilled out now. You know, you understand that sometimes it's just getting that meat and veg down the you know the the live drums and bass and that bit of stuff in the booth the you know the guitar or something once you get that down just going digitally over the top is 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 fine and it kind of sometimes suits it as well oh interesting you know, to, to, yeah, to, to, to hy hybrid the two you know i'm not a super tape nerd that just has to uh stay on it religiously and, and I, I just love working on the computer solely as well it's got a different flavor as well you know which is relevant for other music i don't know it's a commercial studio soup and we don't just record you know lo-fi you know grungy <laughs> guitar bands and stuff there's all sorts of stuff in you know so you get the joy of going through really clean focus right focus right pre's straight to you know high-end digital back end 
you know, and just hearing this, wow, this openness and this clarity, you know, by not from not using the tape. So it's just good to have both, really. And you choose, you know, you choose the projects that you think are going to really enjoy working with the tape. Yeah. You know, so it's amazing how many bands come in and like, what's that? Oh, you really? Know, like Interesting. The, yeah, yeah. Just never, never seen one before. Never even kind of real, you know. I guess a young kid these days, you know, they, why would the if you weren't into the historical, you know, the historics of recording, and you've just grown up with recording on computers and stuff, why would you ever think it was any different, you know? And it's like it's quite a shock to us. What you record on that? How does that work? You know, <laughs> That's sign of getting a bit older, but you know, it's uh, it's inter yeah. it's Sorry. interesting. I think that it's um, it, it's. I I think if when you're um, proficient at something, you know, as a as a musician, I think it's important to to understand the the background through it. You know, I um, I uh, I studied jazz when I was at college, and yeah. as part of studying jazz, you have to study the the history of jazz. And even though you know I don't go out and play trad jazz, but having a, a good understanding of trad, uh, you know, what a drummer's role in the early 1900s was. Um, arguably that set me up really well for for a, sort of a career idolizing Ringo because that's you know yeah that's essentially what his job is just slightly more glorified and um and I yeah. think that recording wise um I think it's important especially now that there's a bit of a resurgence about sort of um analog recording and, and using tape um, and understanding the the merits in the process I think it's quite important yeah. that some of the um, the sort of younger generation start to to understand, and I think it's really good that you you're still actively attempting to use a tape machine when you can, and yeah. and sort of hopefully educating a few people that didn't know what it was and yeah. what the benefits were, and and how important it is to 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 it's the process of it, isn't it? You know, musicianship has to be high. You've got to make choices, and you've got to to do all the things that you that tape makes you do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's you know, there's bands that come in and they've come to suit because we have a tape machine, and they haven't used one before. Um, and it's not always because of the myth of how you know how good it's going to sound or how different or whatever. You know, sometimes they've just read about exactly what you said. It was they they it's a nod. They'd like to record with a little nod to how it used to be done. Where yeah, they'll they'll sit and rehearse the part longer. You'll you know you'll nail your shit better before getting it down. You know, and that people like ways of putting the pressure on on themselves to record when they're recording you know to try and push themselves a little further you know and the tape really shines on those kind of bands you know the jazz bands the kind of the people who are just amazing at improvising and amazing players you know because it's not they're not expecting to uh stop can you rewind that can we do that bit again drop me <laughs> in here blah 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 you know it's the it's the real you know uh the real you know uh, technical musical talent you know that really really shine when you use tape because it is des it's designed for you know for for a really well rehearsed band to get some stuff down it's too clunky and slow and annoying if you just <laughs> want to quickly get stuff down you know or you're just used to at home like putting something on loop and recording it you know until you've got the right take and then move on that's it. I, I um, I'm thinking about uh, one of the tracks that you've got up on the website. I think you've just called it the Soul Band, but it's got a proper um, uh, like Al Green sort of uh, yeah vintage like so what would what would Al Green be sort of early seventies or mid seventies or something? Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I just yeah. love it. That's you've nailed that sound, and I'm assuming that those guys are the sort of guys that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. That was a, a kind of collection of friends from a, uh two or three bands uh who were all who were all in that kind of vein anyway um it's just a bit of a mad get together um uh, but i mean like i say if you if you mute the vocal on that track because he read the singer was in the middle of the room singing you know slightly baffled off but not loads but just belted into that mic you know that it doesn't sound like a great recording when you mute the vocal it's all about that spill on his vocal mic that is, gives it that 3D depth, mm. I think. Uh, you know, and it's on, there's only a certain amount of, you know, singers who can sing sing live really well in a situation like that. 
you know, you know, we did a few takes, obviously, and but yeah, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think that was even when we chopped together. We just they rehearsed it a few times, and uh, yeah, everyone perks up and really, really focuses when, when you've made the situation quite tight like that. You know that that okay, this guy's singing his heart out. Yeah, I'm not going to miss a beat on these drums. You know, I'm not going to fluff this guitar. You know, it forces you to like maybe even play a bit simpler, which is better because that complements the song usually rather than you know knowing that you can redo it or you can mute this and do it again or you know people maybe overplay sometimes. But forcing a situation like that where this singer's singing his heart out, and if you don't back him up properly. <laughs> you know then it's <laughs> that's a really you know, great point not... and if there's if there's spill coming through on the you know on the vocal mic you, you can't you know you can't chop in the drums from another take because it won't it no won't exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah exactly is that you can't do any messing about at all you know if you try and like nudge one bit of something even if it's just like you know because the kick uh, the kick drum on that session was just this you know the big old rca b44 whatever it is just mm. down near the kick near the kick drum somewhere so obviously it's just picking up all the room and everything and probably even the spill from his vocal if you if there's one you know dodgy kick drum just slightly out and you nudge it suddenly you've got this little weird flammy phasey thing going on that's really noticeable so you know <laughs> yeah it's um it reminds me of a a conversation i had with um uh, an engineer in or a producer in in la called clay blair who's a um he has a it's called Boulevard Recording, and um, they, I think, I can't remember what the studio was, it was Hollywood um, Recording Studio or something, and he was talking about um, uh, the spill on Beatles recordings through the vocal mic was essentially the sound of a lot of Beatles recordings, and yeah. uh, you've just said exactly the same thing. I think that, that yeah. um, and then from what you said just after that, it made me think that the you, you're by setting a situation up like that, you're creating a, an environment where everybody who's playing feels like the moment's special. And yeah. when you're playing an individual part um, on your own, you know, like in a in a booth, and the rest of the band sat in the control room listening to to like the drummer play along to some yeah. scratch guide track that that someone's put down, and that's pretty uninspiring because they just threw it down. Um, yeah. yeah, you're there's not really a you know, it, there's no it, comparison there, is no, there? No, and yeah. it, you know, you, you get on the talk back, and it's a, uh, you know, yeah, that was good. Should we just do another one? Um, and yeah. you're just going yeah. through the motions, and then it's, uh, can you just do another one and try uh, try changing the fills up a little bit? <laughs> and yeah, where's the there's, it's the complete antithesis of what you what you've just said, which is like everyone's tingling because if they get this wrong, everyone's gonna yeah. have to do it all again, and yeah, the, you know, the, the tape's yeah. running and it's expensive and it t it's time consuming yeah. to go back yeah I like that. yeah that's true that that's quite funny on that uh that tape machine that sam bought from the uh manfred man estate somewhere someone had put on a, a pound sign sticker on the counter the digital <laughs> counter and it's actually quite accurate you know so uh you know when you've got you know, when you've done 30 minutes it's like 300 looks like 300 pounds or something it's like well that's kind of about right <laughs> you know what I mean? but back then it was it's more expensive now but yeah Oh, I love it, no, but there's nothing, nothing, nothing like a bit of pressure, you know, to uh, <laughs> to get people to, uh, you know, you don't have to go the Phil Spector shotgun route, do you, to get people to <laughs> perform? Oh, it's very timely at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> yeah. There we have it. Uh, the first part of my conversation with Simon Trot. I hope that you enjoyed it. I spoke to Simon um, at length before we recorded the episode. We talked for like an hour on the phone, um, just talking, basically we just both talking about how much we love the Beatles. <laughs> He's such a lovely guy. Um, so in two weeks' time, there will be another episode, uh, the second half of that conversation. Um, and then, uh, as I've alluded to in my introduction, I've got a lot of uh, exciting episodes coming up after that. Um, so yes, it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to my good friend Joe Kane for the intro and outro music he made for this and to my friend David Henshaw for the lovely artwork he supplies. Don't forget you can get in touch with me if you have any episode suggestions, people I should speak to, 
Um, I always get back to everybody who gets in touch with me and I always look into suggestions. Uh, sometimes they're not feasible, but I always look into them. So my email address is joe at allyouneedisdrums.com and my website's allyouneedisdrums.com so you can get in touch through there. Um, you can find me on Instagram at allyouneedisdrums. Okay, so I will see you again in two weeks' time. All right, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>